One of America's favorite patriotic songs describes her bounty. O beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties above thy fruited plain. She's still a country of plentiful foods and great variety. Many Americans were of foreign descent, but they found plenty of new food choices when they arrived. Many of the vegetables that are at the center of our most popular annual feast were here when the pilgrims stepped ashore. Potatoes, both white and sweet, grew first in America. Also, most squash, pumpkins, avocados, many varieties of beans, tomatoes, and corn were all indigenous. To a land of plenty, the Europeans brought many new additions, including the popular apple, which like many immigrants proliferated and realized greater potential in the new soils. Today, foods from every nation can be found in American cities and even small towns. Also, we have plentiful and perhaps too plentiful a supply of manufactured goods that are unlikely to be found in nature. One particular favorite is the donut, which has no discernible nutritional value at all. Sugar, fat, flour, and artificial colors of every type are dropped into a vat of fat and served up with coffee. Let's explore American food, the beautiful and the ugly alike. Very few American restaurant menus are complete without the French fry in some form and consist of the very American potato cooked in a vat of fat. The French may have their pommes frites, but our French fry did not come from France. We think the Belgians came up with this quick method of to add sizzle to a boring white potato. The recipe made it its way back to America with our troops after World War II. It is seldom the central dish, but often accompanies almost any meat, fish, or poultry served in the U.S. The king of food in the American fast food restaurants is the hamburger. It's made its way from Hamburg, Germany, with the big German immigrations of the 1860s. Like many now popular dishes, it got its start on the streets of New York. Today, there is no one way to prepare hamburgers. They come in all sizes, from a couple of ounces to half a pound. The bread is usually a white bun, but can come in a variety of flours and styles. Condiments and vegetables of all sorts adorn the burger particularly yellow mustard and red tomato sauces. Also from Germany, although it arrived a little later, is the hot dog. The hot dog started as the Delschhand sausage on the streets of New York around 1900. The hot dog owes its name to the original sausage, but it's still often called a Frankfurter for its original home in Germany. While the sausage doesn't vary much, one of its most famous proponents, Oscar Mayer, drove around in a hot dog shaped truck to get attention for it. The bread and condiments with which it is served are, however, very varied. Each region and section of cities have a different recipe. The Coney Island dog is smothered in onions and mustard. Nearby, the New York dog 
is often sour includes sauerkraut. My favorite is the Chicago dog, which also includes almost everything. While out in Seattle, the dog is not complete without some hot peppers. Originally a gift from Naples, which was popularized after World War I. The Americanized version originated in New York, of course, and then returned to other parts of Italy which had not discovered it yet. The idea of a flour dish with various sauces, cheeses, vegetables, and meats spread on it is not particularly new, but the combination of tomatoes, cheeses, and particularly pepperoni sausage is very popular. The pizza's popularity really grew with the invention of home deliveries. Today, few teenagers are complete without a slice of pizza in their hand. Of disc based food, there is the popular hot cake. These are particularly popular as a breakfast food. They are likely to be covered in a combination of berries and maple syrup. Forms of the hot cake date back to Roman times, but in the form of a super sweet breakfast, it's probably rooted in America. We tend to associate flapjacks with lumberjacks, who are well, just likely to burn off the immense calorie load of this dish. Uh, I'm not sure why the rest of us eat ex it except to gain weight, but it does taste great. Is another food that was waiting nearby when the pilgrims arrived. The wild turkey is a cunning bird and difficult to hunt. Ben Franklin, favor the turkey as our national bird because of its craftiness in the woodlands. The only time I eat turkey is at Thanksgiving, but with enough of those American favorites and gravy on top, it goes down pretty well. Every culture has stuff that anyone from the outside would refuse to eat. For Americans, it's Scrapple. It's a great tasting breakfast side invented by the German Americans. As anyone knows, there is quite a bit of stuff left over after a pig is butchered that most people wouldn't eat. Scrapple is most of that stuff mixed together and fried to a golden brown. Delicious if you grew up with it, not so much if you didn't. Rotisserie and barbecue cooking are not unique to America. I recall when I lived in Bulgaria, we pretty regularly enjoyed the rotisserie chickens. But barbecue itself probably is primarily American. Uh, Columbus found uh, the indigenous tribes uh, barbecuing, cooking outside with um, meats and adding sauces to them and flavors uh, when he arrived. So that's pretty basic um, American history. They, uh, each region has its own version of the barbecue. And the main thing that may distinguishes them is the changing um, flavors of the barbecue sauces that are added to them. Because depending on the background of the people who settled those areas, they find different flavors uh, interesting. But, and they also choose to barbecue different kinds of meats. So some places the pig may be more popular, other places it may be beef, other places it may be lamb. But what distinguishes um, most regional uh, barbecues is the barbecue sauce. It comes in all varieties in different places. Some places it's sweeter, some places it's um, hotter, um, it, a lot of variety. But a very popular form of cooking in the U.S. Then there is what um, Americans think of, or many Americans think of, as sort of manly cooking. You'll see it in movies and TV shows quite often. 
Um, the kitchen usually belongs to the female spouse, but outside in the yard, it's the man with the grill that's cooking things. And in many cases, well, burning things, but it's still a popular way of preparing food for Americans. Aspect of culture that interests most people, including me, is food. I spent a couple of years in Bulgaria and I don't remember much Bulgarian, but I do remember the bunichka and the salads and the chicken and all that good stuff. So I've chosen a favorite American pastry for this presentation. People often say that something typically American is as American as apple pie. Here's why. Does your country have a food that just makes you feel happy to be who you are? Apple pie is a very American food because it has a rich history, its own mythology, and tastes like home. When the first settlers came to America, there were no apples here. By the time the United States was a young nation, apples had arrived and flourished across the continent. When Americans smell an apple pie cooking, they think of home, family, and happiness. Every culture has its own traditional foods. The apple became part of the American dream, just as the aspiring immigrants did. Early settlers brought many plants from Europe that they hoped to grow in American soil. Few adapted to the soil and climate of the New World, as well as the apple. Early apples were small, tough, and rough, much like the settlers themselves. They both grew and prospered. Today, there are dozens of varieties of apples. Many have a beautiful appearance and varied uses. Granny Smith's are hard, tart, and green apples that are perfect for baking. Red Delicious are sweet, glossy red apples that taste great raw. Those early apples grew, prospered, and became representative of the American culture. History becomes legends, and legends give life to culture. In early America, immigrants soon found themselves moving west, and so did the apple. John Chapman was an early American settler who became known as Johnny Appleseed. He loved apples so much that one day he decided everyone should have apples. He grabbed a bag of seeds and a cooking pot that he wore as a hat. Johnny headed west, planting apple seeds across a dozen states. Today, the story of Johnny Appleseed is told in every school and we celebrate Johnny Appleseed Day every fall. A national food must be delicious. One of the earliest smells that American children remember is that of apples baking in their mother's oven. Sugary apples with a flaky brown crust is served at many holidays or on just about any occasion. Apples, sugar, butter, and flour can be molded into many kinds of pies. Flat tops, crisscross, crumbles, folded pies can all taste great. I like a big slice of crisscross apple pie with a scoop of ice. Apple pie became part of American culture because it came to America with the earliest immigrants, generated its own mythology, and makes the perfect dessert. Most cultures revolve around the home and the family. And the center of the home is the kitchen. The kitchen is where mom is, and almost anything she's cooking smells great to a child. Mothers from many lands have come to America and we're soon baking apples in one form or another because they are always available in American markets. American songs, stories, and films have often had images of the apple in them. What special food makes you think of mom, home, history, family, and taste delicious? 
there's a whole range of American food that's distinguished largely by how you get it. Many places cater to people in cars who drive into a lane order, pay, and pick up the food without ever entering the restaurant. This is a form of very quick food that was perfected by the McDonald's Corporation, which expanded to deliver exactly the same menu to a large number of countries. A steady diet of food, which is prepared with an emphasis on quickness and portability, has a tendency to be fattening and not particularly good, but if it's consistent, people keep buying, knowing they will neither be disappointed nor thrilled. Coffee for many Americans is almost more important than food and may be consumed in great quantities. Sometimes called Joe because the instant version of the coffee got its start as a staple of military life and meals. My parents used to make their coffee with a dripolator or percolator like the one in the picture below, which forces boiling water to steam through the ground of coffee. For a while in the last century, the instant version seemed to predominate but this is largely because the percolated version was not particularly good. So fast, even though also not good, was attractive. In the late 80s, Americans realized that coffee didn't have to be horrible. A series of coffee uh, cafes opened across the country, but they were soon dominated by the Starbucks Corporation, a brand with a good product and a superior advertising budget. Today, the pendulum might be swinging back towards mediocre coffee as the cost of coffee of espressos or lattes has gone up from high to extraordinarily high. Another area in which American cuisine long suffered from, well, more quantity than quality um, is beer. The exception was a brand called Yingling, which was brewed and sold only in Pennsylvania since 1829, and only in the last few decades has it become available. Uh, they've now gone no national, so there is an American alternative to European beers or the newer crafted beers. In the 80s, people began to buy European brands to which our own brands didn't compare well. Most people still buy traditional bland beer because the price is lower, but enough have come to see the difference that there is now a multitude of locally brewed and high quality beers. One of the concerns of much of American food is that it might not be particularly good for us. You can get fruits, vegetables, and meats that compare well against any place in the world, but there's a tremendous amount on the market in which the prime ingredients are sugar and manufactured chemicals. This may account for a geometric rise in the percentage of Americans with diabetes and other nutritional diseases over the past 50 years. While I'm proud to have served both in the American military and our Peace Corps, a very high percentage of potential recruits are too obese are too sick in other ways to serve. While the quality of service people is still very high, it is distressing that so many youths are not fit to be recruited.
In a free society, people get to choose what they eat, at least up to a point that they can't afford it. That marker is pretty manageable for most Americans most of the time. The problem is that we tend to choose foods of known low nutritional value. In a famous court case, the defendant claimed to have committed murder because he was under the influence of Twinkies. As the ingredients suggest, this product and many others consist primarily of white flour and sugar or sugar-like chemicals. One of the great virtues or threats of these products is they're just as edible years after manufacture as they are on the day that they are made. Many products designed for children have these ingredients and are a major part of what is on sale at grocery stores. So some cause for concern. Sodas are much like the cookies, candies, and pies described earlier, uh, except that their main ingredient is sweeteners and dyes. Some sodas claim to be healthy because they contain few calories, but many question whether the chemicals used in lieu of sugar are a nutritional improvement. In a culture of plenty, choices matter.